I'm Megan Doherty and I'm your announcement host this morning. Um, just a couple of quick things we wanted you to know about. The first is that we will be having a blood drive on August 16th in the FLC. Um, it'll be from 8 to 1 p.m. and you need to make an appointment. You can do that online at the website address below. Um, they will only be doing appointments. Next is James is still out of town on vacation this week, so if you need him, he won't be back until next week. We're still doing VBS, VBS tailgate um, in the lower parking lot from 9 to 9.45 on Sunday mornings. If you don't want to come and stay, you can register and pick your materials up. And then we also are looking for somebody who is interested in doing a ladies Zoom Bible study. Um, if you're interested in helping lead that, just email office at aquathumc.org. And then finally, um, the Tuesday morning ladies Bible study will be starting back on August 18th. They'll be doing an eight-week study called Brave Enough. Um, if you're interested in joining that, you can contact Beth Gwynn at the contact information below. Thanks, and let us continue with worship. Hey, guys. I'm Lily Doherty. Welcome to worship service this Sunday at Aquafium C.
Good morning, Ackworth. Oh, what a delight it is to gather today to praise the name of the Lord. Today I'm out at Hard Labor Creek State Park taking a hike to ease my fears of all that is going on, and I invite you to pray with me. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you that you are in our midst. We thank you that every time we see the charts of where COVID is going and that anxiety and fear just rages in us, Lord, we thank you that you fill us with peace. Father, forgive us when we don't remember to turn to you and find our joy. Lord, I thank you for your beauty, for your glory, for your sunshine, that we might partake of it. Lord, I pray that we might be your people, that in the midst of this chaos, that we would seek you and seek your heart. Lord, I am so grateful for the opportunity to serve in your name. I am so grateful for those in our community who, who love on me and share your glory and your wisdom with me. Father, I pray that each and every person within the sound of my voice might find a way to glorify you. Whether they are in the workplace, they are staying at home, they are working from home. Lord, that you might find a way to work through them so that all that they are, all that they say, all that they do, Lord, glorifies you. Father, we desire to be your people, to glorify you in all that we are. Lord, for those of us who have been unfaithful in this time, seek our hearts. Call us back to your word. Let us be in your presence, whether it's in our chair, out in the glorious sunshine and your creation, wherever it is, Lord. Father, the birds sing of your praise, and we thank you. Lord, we gather together to pray as your Son taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you.
Fred moves to town and hunts for an apartment to rent. He's turned down by most landlords because of his large pit bull, Rusty. Eventually, he secures an over-the-garage apartment behind a uh, domicile where his two landlords live in the big house, and he's over the garage in an apartment with Rusty. He assured his two landladies that Rusty was a friendly dog and nothing to worry about. As time went by, everything went well. The only thing that they asked him when he moved in was to be careful of their two pet rabbits. The rabbit hutch was right at the bottom of his stairs as he came down each morning uh, to go to work, and he and Rusty would pass that. He worked on it for a while. Rusty learned to ignore the rabbits, and everything was going well. One night, Fred returned late home, returned home late from work, only to find that uh, he was so tired he let Rusty out to go to the bathroom, lay down on the sofa, went to sleep, and when he woke up, it was Rusty scratching at the door to get back inside. When he opened the door, was horrified to see that Rusty had one of the two rabbits in his mouth, dead. Fred panicked. He brought the rabbit inside. It was covered in dirt and filth and teeth marks, and Fred did his best. He cleaned the rabbit up and put the rabbit back into the rabbit hutch, covered all the evidence, and the next morning hoped that no one would notice that Rusty had anything to do with the rabbit's death. He got up the next morning. He got ready to go to work. As he came down the stairs, the two landladies were standing at the bottom of his stairs looking in the hutch, totally confused. Not knowing what to say, he said, is everything okay? And they said, well, we don't know. You see, three days ago, one of our rabbits died and we buried it, and this morning it showed up back in the hutch. Sometimes, when the best of plans simply do not work out, we have to deal with it. As Fred tried to conceal the truth to protect Rusty, his dog. In the end, the truth was that Rusty did nothing wrong and that Fred was the one who deserved to be blamed for the rabbit's disappearance and reappearance in the hutch. Last week, our teaching was all about blame. The parable of the magic boomerang goes something like this. The magic boomerang, whatever you put on it when you send it out, it will bring back to you. So, if you take the magic boomerang and fill it with your anger and retribution and revenge and judgment and you throw it out into the world, when it comes back, it's going to bring anger, retribution, revenge and judgment back to your own doorstep. Or if you throw it out with love, grace and forgiveness and reconciliation, that is what it will bring back to you as well. We like to think of the world as a place where fairness happens, even though we know frequently it is not. In most literature, theater, and film, we go for the ending where the villain gets what they deserve. Tragic stories have been written, to be sure, but as a rule, they're not going to be as popular because we like to see the bad guys get what they deserve in the end. From children's books to the finest of literature, we want to believe that those who do bad will get bad in return. Christian theology's core belief is that as if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that He has risen from the dead, you will be saved. The counter to this is if you do not do the right things, Eternal life is not promised. Scripture affirms that there will be an ultimate judgment where you and I, along with the rest of humanity, will stand before God. So even if bad people prosper on earth and good people, faithful people, followers of Jesus Christ suffer unjustly in the final analysis in eternity, in the end, God will be the judge. So even in that case, what goes around comes around. If you're abrasive to everyone, you'll be treated abrasively. If you blame everyone, you will be blamed. If you are judgmental, you will be judged. If you are bad, something bad will happen. There is some truth to this. 
I've seen evidence of this happening in the world. If you remember from last week's teaching on blame, Joseph gave a bad report to his father, Jacob, regarding his older brothers watching the family flocks. We're told that, one, his father loved him more than his other sons, that dad gave Joseph a very, very, very expensive coat, which irritated his older brothers even more. And three, Joseph's brothers were filled with jealousy and hatred of their younger brother, Joseph. Joseph blamed the brothers for not being as special and underperforming as dutiful sons. The Joseph's brothers blamed all their ill treatment and jealous rage on Joseph. And as a result, the brothers sold Joseph into slavery. He was carried off by a hairy bunch of Ishmaelites, if you're familiar with Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat, and sold into slavery to a rich family and in Egypt. At first, Joseph flourishes and became the head of the household. That did not last long. Eventually, he was blamed for immoral actions, even though he didn't do it, and was imprisoned for what some say could be as much as 40 years. In the Bible, 40 years is a long time, about an average lifespan in that generation. Due to his intelligence and his ability to interpret dreams for Pharaoh, Joseph gets a reprieve and rises to become Pharaoh's number one man in Egypt. Because of a famine in the Promised Land, Jacob's sons, Joseph's brothers, the former grumpy siblings, travel to the Egyptian food pantry to get some supplies. Joseph recognizes them They do not recognize Joseph. So after many years of blaming each other, they now stand together. The brothers unknowingly bow before the ultimate power of their hated younger brother, whom they sold into slavery. It's time for the magic boomerang to come back around and return a portion of the suffering, the indignity, to the mean, hateful, older brothers. Let's hear from Genesis 45, beginning in verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. He cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were unable to answer him because they were terrified. At his presence. Then Joseph said to his brother, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save the lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years, There has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. This is the word of God for the sometimes vengeful people of God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this time we ask that you would allow our eyes to see as you see our ears to hear what you hear, and our hearts to love whom you love, so that our lives will be changed for good. Amen. So, okay, according to the magic boomerang theory, this is an epic fail. Joseph spent most of his life exiled and imprisoned due to the jealousy of his older brothers. Now, at this critical moment, when Joseph has all of the power available to seek payback, Joseph dishes out nothing but forgiveness to his brothers who wronged him. This ending surprises most of us as much as it does when Joseph's father, Jacob, is forgiven by his twin brother, Esau, after Jacob cheated his brother out of his blessing and his birthright. The brothers deserve and clearly expect punishment, suffering, vengeance. Instead, their boomerang comes back around with forgiveness 
love and reconciliation. In fact, throughout Scripture, while justice is an admirable virtue, mercy and forgiveness are lifted up as the highest, perhaps most godlike, behavior on earth. In fact, I would argue with anyone willing to listen that the entire life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ reveals the loving, forgiving heart of God more clearly than anything else in all creation. So instead of avoiding blame, which was last week's sermon, this week we're seeking forgiveness. And we do that by seeking the forgiveness of God. Step one, we have to forgive God. God does not need our forgiveness. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's a real challenge for many that I've met over my life. For whatever reason, their life stinks. And they come to see themselves as children of a lesser God, or to say it in another way, people who are cursed by God and their circumstances. It could be mental or emotional illness. It could be physical abnormalities. Their skin may not be the right color. They might have been born into the wrong family. Their life is not what they think it should be. There was a bumper sticker around for years that said, Life stinks, then you die. People, many people, come into existence and struggle to reach adulthood without ever getting a fair shot at life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Many others have crushing tragedies occur, perhaps through no fault of their own. These cursed people arrive at the conclusion that God has either cursed or tormented their existence, or that God has at least done nothing to prevent it. The blame goes to God for their suffering and their trials. Step one is to become aware that the brokenness in this world and in their lives is not because of God, but because of the sin that infects all creation unfairly. It promotes an advantage and a disadvantage based on our broken human system, not because of God. In the story of Noah, we see that God is not the problem. It is the lack of us living like God instructs us that we cause the systems of injustice and pain and dysfunction and suffering in the world. To seek forgiveness, we must stop blaming God for suffering and instead seek, receive, and return God's love. Step two towards seeking forgiveness is to forgive ourselves. The thing about forgiveness is we must first receive it before we can give it. So many, myself included at times, are so quick to believe that God has forgiven them, but they're very slow to believe that they can ever forgive themselves for messing up. In speaking to veterans frequently, they will mention the pain they still carry from them from times in combat. Jesus forgives all of that. At times, I've had spouses share when they have been unfaithful in their marriage and felt that nothing they do can deserve forgiveness. I can't speak to the breach of the relationship, but I can affirm that Jesus forgives that too. They have to forgive themselves. They have to ask forgiveness from those they hurt. But forgiveness from God is total. People who suffer with drugs, alcohol, sex addictions, addictions, forgiven. Self-hatred and loathing is one of the most destructive diseases loose in the world today. It takes good, gifted people who are created in the image of God and convinces them that they are not young enough, that they're not old enough, that they're not pretty enough, rich enough, powerful enough, smart enough, or good enough to be loved by God or anyone else. Lewis B. Smeads tells us that to forgive is to set a prisoner free and then discover that that prisoner was you. Joseph is able to experience God's forgiveness perhaps through his many trials, and as a result, he breaks the cycle of what goes around comes around. 
In the Gospels, when the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, one of the key ingredients in the Lord's Prayer is asking and accepting forgiveness for the times we have fallen short, but also seeking to forgive others who have trespassed against us. This leads us to the final step in forgiveness. When we seek forgiveness, we also have to seek to forgive others. In the story of Joseph, also in the story of Jesus, and in many other stories of the Bible, our standard is to do for others what God has done for us, namely, forgive. As we said last week about the teaching that says we hate and Jesus returns love, we reject and Jesus accepts, we blame and Jesus forgives. So this week we have to seek to forgive others as Jesus has forgiven us. As Jesus was nailed to a piece of wood, he said, Father, forgive them. When Jesus was asked how many times to forgive, seven times seven or 70 times seven was his answer. One of the most compelling reasons I choose to follow the call that Jesus gives to us all is because of an all of human history that I see. Jesus is the only one who did not use his position or advantage to his own well-being. And he loved so godlike that when he was betrayed, denied, falsely blamed, beaten, killed, in one of the most cruel ways known to mankind at that time, he responded by offering forgiveness. His followers, the disciples who had gotten so little right during his time on earth, once they met the resurrected Christ were so empowered by the example and teaching of Jesus Christ following the resurrection that they went out and started to live, teach, and do what Jesus did. And that's what we as the church are called to do each and every day. The story of Archbishop Desmond Tutu visiting Nelson Mandela in prison. Now there's a backstory for all of the younger folks there who do not know Archbishop Desmond Tutu or Nelson Mandela. They were both citizens of South Africa. At that time, the population of South Africa was more than 80% black, yet less than the 20% that was the white population there were the only ones allowed to vote that had access to education and health care. Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for 27 years for speaking out about this injustice. For the first 18 years, Mandela was held at the Robben Island Prison, which was formerly a leper colony. He was held in isolation in a cell that had no plumbing and no bed, and he was forced to work each day in hard labor at the local lime quarry on the island. Reverend Desmond Tutu was an Anglican priest in South Africa. Reverend Tutu was allowed to visit and to serve communion to Nelson Mandela while he was in prison. His imprisoned friend was at that time at a low point in his life. And after the visit, after prayer, and after blessing the elements, Tutu invited the white prison guard to sit down and to share communion with them. After a moment of stunned confusion, the prison guard got a stool, put down his rifle and his gun, and sat with the other two men, both African, both had every reason to exclude the white guard. Tutu served Mandela, then together with Mandela holding the chalice, Tutu offered bread to the white prison guard, the body of Christ given for you. And then the guard had to dip his bread in the chalice held by the prisoner, Nelson Mandela. The body of Christ poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. The guard receiving the forgiving blood of Christ from the very person that he imprisoned. The magic boomerang fails again. Undoubtedly, there are people in your life whom you need to forgive. 
The remarkable part of the Mel Nelson Mandela story is he is released from prison and eventually becomes the president of South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu eventually wins the Nobel Peace Prize. They had to learn how to forgive and to model that at an early time. Tutu eventually calls the prison cell of Mandela the crucible that gave birth to equality in South Africa. There are those people in your life and in my life who truly deserve disdain and vengeance. But we are called by Christ to swap out that magic boomerang and to replace it instead with grace, forgiveness, and mercy. Let it be so. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for the grace and forgiveness offered through each one of us that we experience in your sacrificial love. As we prepare to go forth, challenge us to forgive one another as you have forgiven us. Help us to do that today and in all our remaining days. Give each of us the courage to let go of what keeps us from you and to trust in you. Help us, help us to love you more and to love each other. Amen. Amen. I hope you will tune in again next week as Hannah Stubblefield is going to bring our message. She'll be bringing the sermon on August 16th. She's looking forward to preaching, and I'm looking forward to being blessed by it as we stream it together. This worship service was offered as a gift from God. You don't have to do anything but to receive it. I pray it blesses you wherever you are. If, however, you're familiar with the mission and the ministry of Ackworth United Methodist Church to make disciples as we come, connect, grow, and go, and you have the means to support the ministries of the church, if God has blessed you in a way that you can return a portion of that, uh, then I encourage you to do that as we listen to this closing song together. May God bless you. There's information for giving up on the screen. And uh, as we go forth this week, stay safe, my friends. Amen. So oh God, you wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy, and nothing can keep us apart. So. God of Jacob, you use the weak to lead the strong, you lead us in the song of your salvation, and all your people sing along, so So remember your